Hey, everyone. Oh, what was I? Well, I think, Ryan, you can take your, the stage is yours. <laughs> So guys, we're about to start. Ryan, it's nice to have you here. And um, yeah, people still gathering around. But let's start with some serious question, I think. What about cats, Ryan? What about cats? You have cats everywhere, like the main logo, podcast, new products. Yeah, uh, glad you started off with a serious question. Um, so cats, uh, is, a lot of people have asked me this question. Um, for those that know Product Hunt, you'll probably notice there's this ridiculous looking Google Glass wearing yeah. cat on our website. And we have shirts and stickers and we do meetups across the world and everyone is wearing these, these cat tattoos sometimes on their forehead. Uh, I have pictures to prove it. Um, the story behind the cat really was somewhat organic in the very beginning. It was actually created by a guy named Jesse. He reached out in the early days of Product Hunt and, and said, hey Ryan, I love what you're doing with Product Hunt. We'd love to create you know, some t-shirts or some swag for you for free. And at the time, we were pre-funded. We had no money. And I was like, that sounds great. Like, we would love that. Thanks. And he did a bunch of different illustrations. One of them, or a few of them, were really bad, honestly. Some of them were too literal. They had uh, like Product Hunt with a, a target and arrows. It was really aggressive. Um, and there are a lot of others. And, and one was this cat wearing Google Glass. And uh, I just liked it, honestly. It wasn't anything strategic. I wasn't data driven by it. I was just like, this is ridiculous and kind of fun. And I thought it represented sort of the culture of Product Hunt, something that's friendly and welcoming and, and a little bit silly. Yeah, it's awesome. I think yeah. I don't, don't yeah. really want to interrupt you, but uh, yeah. Ryan, do you mind uh, taking the mic closer to your mouse because yeah. there are some issues with the sound? Is, it, is that better? Yeah, it's better. Uh, that's awesome. Okay. I can hear myself better now, too. Yeah, me Great. too. So I think uh, in some ways, the logo of the product, it's um, like um, really about culture. So it's, I, I think it's awesome. So to the actual, actual questions that we have, uh, I have to run. Um, you yourself is a maker, and uh, you have a background in product, manager, product management. So I think um, m me, myself, and the audience is very interested in, in um, Maybe some lessons or mistakes, uh, what you learn when you was a product manager and uh, how you see it like from now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my, my background initially was in marketing. So I went from a uh, marketing intern and fell into product management. And I was 22 or so when I became a product manager. And I, when I look back, I was, I'm kind of embarrassed actually. I did a lot of stupid things. I think that a lot of, uh, you know, I think a lot of people maybe hopefully can relate to. Um, some of those, for example, when I was a product manager at the beginning, I didn't really think much about how to work with and communicate with the rest of the team. A lot of what I, I felt uh, was most important is for me to define what to build. Mm -hmm. And so I spent all this time, a lot of times on the weekend, because I was like, I'm going to work hard, I want to you know, do the best for the company. And so I thought I was being helpful by working on the weekends and documenting specs and creating wireframes. And in hindsight, I realized that was a huge mistake. Uh, I was one living in my own box. I wasn't really talking to customers. I wasn't talking with the team and getting their input. And two, it was also not very helpful in building uh, buy-in and getting people excited to build a product together. Because if you are basically handed a sheet of here are the things to build, people yeah. don't get excited about that. And they it don't also engage. doesn't result in yeah. best product. Um, and so a lot of those mistakes were made early in my career and uh, you know, through mentorship from other people and just learning on the job, I, I hopefully am a little bit better at it. But Took a lot of a lot of time uh, mm -hmm. in learning, I guess. Yeah. Okay. And um, as I heard from your interview, community uh, takes a really big pl place uh, when you are yourself building a product's hands and other products. So maybe you can share with us some uh, insights about it. How you can incorporate community to your product uh, creation process? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many people are product managers in the room? Raise your hand. I'm just curious. Yeah. Wow, a lot. that's a lot, because that's actually so quite amazing, because there aren't very many, compared to other roles, product management is actually pretty infrequent. Um, so that's awesome. Uh, I love the role of product management, and as it relates to product and community, Product Hunt is a unique, um, I guess, company in that we're basically, our, our entire success and failure is based on the community. Without the people on Product Hunt, without a votes, comments, people making things, we don't have anything. And so... What we focused on a lot in the beginning and to this day is thinking, 
how do we incorporate the community in the product building mm -hmm. process? And whether you're building a community-based product or not, this can be a helpful and useful tactic. And examples of this are we oftentimes would share mock-ups of what we're building. And we'll send an, a, like an Envision mock-up to the community and say, hey, what do you think about this thing that we're building? With some context and details. And just solicit advice, feedback, mm -hmm. ask people, hey, add comments, add, add things that are confusing, ideas that you might have. And when we first did it, we had, for those that haven't used Envision, you basically can you know, annotate anywhere on the mock-up, and there'll be these little red dots where a comment is made. And so it might be pointing to a very specific part of the design. And when we sent it out, a few hours later, we just had dots all over the page. And wow. it was really cool to see all this feedback coming in before we even built anything. Again, this is just visuals. And we used that then to understand, oh, maybe this is not the right you know, design pattern, or oh, maybe we should explore this idea that this person is suggesting. And that was, that was just great to get that feedback. And also, the people that contributed felt more involved in the product. They felt like they were, in some ways, shaping the product, and they were. Uh, and so we tried to take that, uh, you know, we don't share everything that we're designing in advance, but with some things that we're designing, we'll, we'll share it, and it's just helpful to get that kind of feedback early and often. Yeah, okay, it's interesting. So it's kind of like community-driven product development. Kind so of, the, yeah. And it, but there's one, what I will say is, of course, we don't, of course, build everything or change everything based on people's feedback. You need to also analyze that, try to understand why are they suggesting that particular thing. Maybe the idea that they're suggesting isn't necessarily the right solution, but the problem or the goal that they're trying to solve with that suggestion is, is something that you actually want to understand. Mm -hmm. Okay, as far, as far as I know, um, you have like more than 50% of uh, Product Hunt community from the abroad, abroad of US, and um, how, how they react to the changes of the Product Hunt because they like, have a different mindset and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we have over half, half of the community is outside the U.S. A lot of people, they, they make this assumption since we're based in San Francisco, a lot of people assume that we're very Silicon Valley based and that most of the community is in Silicon Valley, but it's actually less than 2% of our audience is actually in Silicon Valley. And uh, furthermore, our team at Product is also distributed. We have... I'm losing track. Three people in San Francisco and then about 14 others elsewhere from Bulgaria, Paris, Toronto, New Zealand, India, all over the world. And so that's given us some global perspective on the team. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of mirrored our audience itself, which is also global. And it's what's kind of cool. Somebody asked me, actually yesterday, somebody asked me, hey, Ryan, why don't you split Product Hub into like European Product Hunt or India Product Hunt, US Product Hunt, like separate them geo uh, based on geos? And actually, I think that'd be the wrong direction because what is cool is to see the diversity of ideas across the world of people building products and the products that come out of Europe and, and India and, and Toronto and whatnot, it's fun to kind of see what people are creating and in some ways see patterns. Um, for example, for whatever reason, and this maybe isn't a surprise to, to some people, but everything that comes out of Paris is just beautifully, beautifully designed. Like the products are just always, from a design aesthetic perspective, really beautiful. Um, and I find that kind of fun and, and enjoyable. Yeah, you can saw a difference about different approach, different nations. Okay. Um, while we create in our products, uh, we tend to look at the metrics, like re recent time, I think. And uh, sometimes we, we um, look to metrics uh, so much that we can lose touch with uh, our clients, customers, and the stuff. And you talking about different approach, totally different, as I understand. Um, you're trying to look to the community. But what about met metrics that you use? Uh, you, you, are you using it, mm -hmm. some metrics? And what, what, what's um, this is metrics? Yeah, um, we certainly use metrics, and we have core KPIs that we're, we're optimizing for. We actually have like three, three KPIs that every product and every initiative should basically be, be moving directly or indirectly. Mm -hmm. And uh, that centers around like just general user growth, revenue, and community contributions, which is kind of like a measurement of community health. And so we look at metrics a lot, and we do some things to actually test ideas using metrics and data. One example, small example, that we recently did was we, we historically have had like Twitter and Facebook as the primary login methods. And we had this uh, hypothesis that some people just didn't want to log in with their social profiles, especially if they maybe were logging in from more of a business perspective. And so we thought, OK, why don't we explore what Google login would look like? Um, and, and would people actually use it? 
So we put a button on the page, on the login page, and about 40, 45% of people mm -hmm. clicked Google login over other login options. Um, unfortunately, we didn't actually implement the login at that time. We just put the button there and counted the clicks. Um, so it was a little bit of a Wizard of Oz test, but mm -hmm. it proved out that people wanted to log in with Google, and that informed us to, to then you know, build out the Google login functionality. And, and, um, and so we've done things like that to use data to inform some hypotheses and like, some assumptions. Uh, and at the same time, though, if you're building something brand new, like that's more of an optimization. Mm -hmm. If you're building something brand new, a lot of times you have to just base it on your gut and your intuition on what you know about the audience and the user. Mm -hmm. And we have used surveys in the past, too, to, to ask our community questions and try to understand, like, what are their motivations, what are their goals, and then try to use that to inform product decisions. But, um, yeah, a lot of that you just have to, you can't really use data. You don't have data to go off of. Yeah, okay. Um, maybe you, you can share with us uh, some insights about uh, like growth hacking and the stuff. Uh, because uh, as far as I know, Product Hunt starts uh, from the email, email newsletter, mm -hmm. and uh, he grows, grows, grows. And uh, I'm, I'm really curious about may maybe there is some insights from past couple years where Product Hunt was already a website. And maybe uh, something you can share about how, uh, how the growth was driven. So mm -hmm. it's really interesting. Though. Yeah, there, actually, there's a bunch of different frameworks and ideas that you can look at product under. And one of them is, uh, if you look at products, and this applies to a lot of different types of products out there, but as flywheels, it's actually really interesting to dissect a product experience in that way. What I mean by that is uh, product on the initial design and everything actually wasn't, it was thoughtful, but it wasn't, thought of as a flywheel, and the product and flywheel is sort of organically born. And the way it works is you have someone that finds a product. This is sort of the, the, the circular, I wish I had a diagram to show. Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of how it works. Someone finds a product, hopefully they think to share it on Product Hunt because they think it's a cool product, think that other people will like it, then they share it. That hopefully then introduces it to the maker. The maker of that product sees that, they share it with their audience, and then their audience are also makers. And so there's a circular motion where the more people that post products leads to more makers, which leads to more people, which leads to more products, and so on and so forth. And so that flywheel is inherent to the design of Product Hunt and how it functions. Mm -hmm. And the more efficient that flywheel works, the more people that do each action, the, the, the lower our friction between each action, the better the system works, and the more users essentially come to Product Hunt, discover Product Hunt. And so I think there's different ways that you can look at flywheels and try to apply it to your own product. You might have an existing product experience and you might realize this is something that we've done in, in other aspects of Product Hunt where we've realized, wow, we have this flywheel of step one, two, three, four, but actually step six, between step five and six is actually really mm -hmm. bad. The, it's, it's a lot of friction or maybe we're failing in some way. Um, and if we fix this step, that actually might complete the flywheel um, and then therefore lead to growth and, and whatnot. Okay, and uh, maybe you, you can talk about what uh, are you have done, like in product hand, to um, fill these gaps. I think. Yeah. So, so one example. So going back to the the home page kind of posting flywheel that I described, one one thing that was missing in the beginning that was somewhat organic in how we discovered it was uh, initially people would find products, post them, and fairly organically makers would then start to discover that their product was posted. And initially, it wasn't. There wasn't actually a system to tag makers. There was no um, like badge that we would put on makers. We actually didn't reach out to any makers. It, was, it wasn't even thought of in the beginning. But we realized that some people were notifying makers or makers would see in their Google Analytics, oh, I'm getting traffic from Product Hunt. What is this site? What is this thing? And that was then a realization that, oh, we should make this more efficient. We should find ways to enable the community to actually tag makers. And so now today, if you know the username of uh, a maker of some product, you can then just tag them and we'll notify mm -hmm. them on Twitter if it's a Twitter username or via email if we already have their email address. And that's kind of one part of the, the step of that flywheel that we um, have attempted to address and, and try to improve. Sounds awesome, really. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot more things that we want to do there um, in terms of like now if, now if you take that, how do you take it a step further and make it like, how could we even automate that process entirely? How can we um, ensure that every single maker is tagged efficiently? And it's, to get to that step is a hard problem to solve, but it's a, it's a problem worth solving because we know how it impacts the overall effect. Okay, so it's actually a tool you, which you can apply to 
every kind of products, yeah? You can apply it to a lot of, lot of different products. I wish, um, trying to think of another example. Um, well, Angelus Talent Platform actually has aspects of this in that, uh, for those that don't know, the Angelus Talent Platform is a huge audience of people in technology uh, basically matching companies to talent. So it could be engineer, product manager, designer, et cetera. And part of that flywheel is, is based on the fact that it's uh, initially and still to this day a free platform where companies can post job openings for free, which then attracts uh, candidates, which then attracts matches, which then attracts more companies to discover the talent platform and post their jobs. And that's kind of how the flywheel works. Again, it's kind of easier to describe with visuals, I think, than, than, than audio. Okay. So um, here's another question, I think. Um, let's, let's stop this topic of product management, I think. It's enough. But uh, we can uh, refer to, like, product trends or tech, tech trends. There, there is a lot of what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. right now, and uh, new trends are rise and old ones are fallen. So what do you think about um, current trends like blockchain, um, well, AI, something? Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, how, how they will um, change products that we use, that we're creating right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I mean, this topic is super fascinating because every day on Product Hunt, well, if you look at kind of the, the macro level, um, and I wish we had actual data on this, but subjectively you can see the trends on Product Hunt where, you know, a few years ago, uh, three years ago, let's say, a lot of anonymous apps, back when Secret was really popular, there were a lot of anonymous apps that were really popular and everyone was creating an anonymous version mm -hmm. of something. And then there was Uber for X, so everyone was creating like an, an on-demand startup for, for something. Um, and of course now today we're seeing a lot of blockchain, crypto-related companies, mm -hmm. a lot of... Um, AI, in some cases, AI, they just sprinkle it on for marketing. It's not necessarily like anything different than you know, what was launched two years ago. Um, and so trends are really fascinating. I think for those that are building products, it can be, I think it can be a trap to, though, to fall into some of the trends in some ways. And what I mean by that is some people, I feel, they, they see the hype and the excitement around blockchain and crypto. And so they almost like force a way to apply it to whatever they want to build. And sometimes it doesn't make sense, or sometimes it's they're trying to solve a problem that isn't native to them. It's not like there. There's a concept of uh, founder market fit in that the best founders generally are, for whatever reason, equipped or very. Um, uh, they're basically solving a problem for themselves, or they have some sort of unique advantage to solve that particular problem. And so trends can sometimes be a, a, a trap where people get attracted to this trend and mm -hmm. they start building a product that they have no business building. Like if I was, for example, to build. Um, I actually had this idea to build like a laundry, on-demand laundry service. And I, like, I'm the worst person to build an on-demand laundry service. Like I have no passion for that at all. Okay. I have no interest. And so that's like kind of an example of like how I think trends can be um, one of those things that just pull people away from what they probably are truly best built to, to build. Um, but at the same time, trends are exciting because they basically represent a new opportunity, a new thing that you couldn't do last year or even yesterday maybe. And that is something worth exploring and figuring out but what, how could I use blockchain maybe to uh, solve this particular problem? Or mm -hmm. how can AI be used to solve this particular problem today that wasn't possible yesterday? Okay, so it's like automated laundry on blockchain? Yeah, yeah, blockchain-based AI laundry is my yeah. next startup. I'm announcing it here. It's okay. exclusive. Um, <laughs> officially, now it's officially, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but what's your favorite one of the tech, tech trends? My favorite tech trend? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'd say it's my favorite tech trend, but it's a space I'm particularly interested in, is, which is voice and audio. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I find that exciting is because uh, we're already seeing a lot of our behavior shift from tapping on a screen, whether it's keyboard or your phone, uh, which is all visual-based, into an audio-based interface with computers and technology. And we're seeing even people uh, form habits around uh, their voice that they didn't have you know, last year, where people, like my girlfriend in the past, she's, she's yelled, okay, Google, play Porter Robinson or something. And this will be like in her home. She doesn't even have a Google home in her, in her place, so she's talking to nobody. Um, and so there's, there's these behaviors that people are forming around audio and voice, and we're also seeing these devices being adopted across millions and millions of homes. So we're sort of at that time where it's still nascent, it's still really early, but we'll start to see new opportunities rise uh, from audio and voice. And um, I've invested in a couple different companies in the mm -hmm. space that are doing 
trying to do some new things, um, placing a bet on you know, an audio-based future. And if you look at movies like Her or really any sci-fi movie, um, it's kind of fascinating and fun to look at sci-fi movies from last year or even 20 years ago and, and sort of the future that they paint. And Her, for those, I'm sure, has, who has seen Her? Oh man, more of you need to see Her. It's such a good film. It's a little long, but it's a really good film. Uh, it, for those that aren't familiar with it, basically they, they paint a picture of the future where everyone is wearing some headset device, kind of like an AirPod. Yeah, and they're like all, AirPods, yeah. You've seen uh, yeah. it, yeah. They're all talking and, and interacting with computers through their voice um, and listening. And, and um, It's really fascinating. There's a lot of um, things that we'll see in the future that I think me or her later on. Okay, and uh, how do you think, how fast it will come to our, like, common come come life, like the voice uh, interfaces and the stuff, because I know that in the US there is a lot of Alexas uh, sold, mm -hmm. but um, it's like an exception, I think, mostly. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I don't, I know the sales numbers are somewhere between 40 to, somewhere between 40 and 60 million US homes have an yeah. Alexa or Google Home device, um, which is pretty high penetration compared to a couple years ago. Um, I haven't looked at the global numbers, um, but Generally, when I look at trends, there's always going to be some sort of uh, initial point where it starts, where it's popular, and it starts to grow from there. And in many cases, sometimes if you look at, not necessarily applicable to voice and, and audio, but if you look at particular companies or trends, a lot of times they also focus on like the 1% or the, the uh, you know, people with a lot of money. Uh, Uber is an example of that. You know, it's probably the, one of the most clear examples where it was a black car service, really expensive. Most people couldn't afford it, just in San Francisco. And of course, now it's, it's everywhere um, and much cheaper uh, than actual taxis. Yeah, OK. And um, but maybe you can have some ideas with, um, which you can share with us, like uh, which products could be built uh, on top of these audio interfaces? Mm. Um, I think one exercise I might go through is thinking through what what behavior do people do on a regular basis, whether it's like daily or, or just frequently, that is better suited for voice than it is for, for typing? Um, so there's, there's examples for myself that are very small examples, and, and maybe there's not a product opportunity around this necessarily, but there are examples where voice is better to uh, get the weather report. So in the mornings, I'll usually, when I'm like getting dressed, I'll say, okay, Google, what's the weather today? Mm -hmm. And it'll just tell me, you know, high is whatever, low is whatever, and then I know what to put on. And that's easier than opening up my phone and typing, and I can do it while I'm multitasking. And so there's, that's kind of one exercise I might think through, is like, what is better using a voice than, than typing on your phone or, or at your computer? Um, and then I think also the B2B use cases are, are kind of fun to, to explore as well. A lot of people think, about their sell themselves and the consumer applications. There's also maybe if you dive into different industries, how could you use voice maybe within a B2B context that's more efficient? Um, I know that there are companies working on more of the B2B um, kind of approaches. Uh, and it'll be just interesting to see how that changes the workplace. Because the good thing about B2B is it more often than not has some sort of direct revenue impact or efficiency mm -hmm. impact, and therefore potentially a much better business than trying to go the consumer route, which is you know, very hard to actually uh, pull off. Yeah, now I remember that uh, here in, in Russia, I think uh, we have a couple of startups that make uh, automation voice calls, like for mm -hmm. HR. Yeah. So, okay, yeah. There's a, there's a semi-evil, I, I, I wouldn't say evil, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> semi-nefarious. I don't like cold calls, that's why I say that. Yeah, um, but... Uh, but good example. Yeah, it's, it's a good example, but you know, it's... Um, but yeah, it may be a cultural thing. It's really strange to talk to nothing. Like, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, wait a moment, I have another question. Okay. Um, is there anything uh, in terms of products right now that uh, you really interested in it could keep you up, keeps you up at night? Uh, Specific products or, or spaces? Or uh, spaces. Let's start spaces. with spaces. Yeah. Um, actually, going <laughs> not, not to bring it back to blockchain, but uh, blockchain is, is also a really interesting space within it when it comes to social networks and social interactions online that I'm, I'm by far not an expert in, but very fascinated and curious by. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason why is if you look at 
traditional social networks and the way they've operated, they've all, of course, been centralized. And the people that have used the social networks, the people that actually create all the value in those networks, uh, they don't derive any of the direct re revenue or value out of that company. So if you were to imagine what would Facebook like look like if it was built uh, with blockchain and some sort of uh, token aspect where the people who contributed and actually provided the value for the network actually earned some actual revenue or, or some monetary um, benefit out of that. And that's a really interesting uh, thing to consider because it starts to shift the behaviors and the ways that you can incentivize networks of people in very different ways that weren't possible before. So it kind of goes back to what I was saying before, is like what, what's now possible with this mm -hmm. new technology or this new trend that wasn't previously? And this is one of the reasons why Facebook is building and has built a, a team entirely focused on exploring those opportunities. And, um, and I think it's important for Facebook and incumbents like it to, to consider like how could they be, I hate to use the word disrupted, but how could they be disrupted and what new technologies um, you know, threaten their, their current foothold? But, yeah, there are a lot of disrupting technologies, potentially disrupting technologies, but still we have like um, a little, I think, amount of uh, really big products like Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp and stuff. But uh, for a long time, I think a uh, couple of years at least, there is nothing new happened like this much big. And um, where, are, where are these kind of products? Yeah. Well, so there's, there's another framing too when you, that's similar to trends, but there's two different framings that I also like to look at when it comes to whether you're building a product or from an investor perspective. And those are platform shifts and behavior shifts. And sometimes those, are, those two things are very intertwined. Uh, but platform shifts, uh, you know, mobile, the, the rise of smartphones and mobile is the reason why uh, you know, Instagram and Snapchat and those companies are where they are today. They took advantage of this pl new platform, which is your mobile phone, and created new experiences that weren't possible on your desktop. Mm -hmm. They're actually, you know, Daily Booth. Who remembers Daily Booth? Anybody? Um, no. So, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's about a decade old company. And uh, it was desktop web-based product that was for sharing a daily selfie. So it was like using your webcam, taking a selfie. And in a different world, in a different time, Daily Booth would it have become something like Snapchat. You know, it's actually, that experience is better suited for mobile. And Daily Booth, it, it, it grew, I don't know their numbers exactly, but millions of people used it, but it ultimately failed, uh, in part because the platform just wasn't right. And so going back to what I, what I mentioned, there's platform shifts, then there are also behavior shifts, which are kind of what I described with audio, where people's behaviors are shifting because of sometimes new platforms. In other cases, it's generational shifts, so if you look at uh, Snapchat also benefited from a younger generation that didn't want to share photos on Facebook with their grandma and their family and whatnot. And they sought out more ephemerality to, to service the, um, the, the need and desire to share something more authentically that mm -hmm. wasn't permanent, that they couldn't be judged by. And that was a generational shift. And so while you might see a lot of platforms like Facebook and, and uh, you know, WhatsApp and all these others, Line, Kakao, like all these kind of almost old school decade long players um, still like dominating when it comes to a number and metrics perspective, all of those are susceptible to platform and behavior shifts. If they don't adapt to these changes, then other companies, other startups can, can come in and, and rise to prominence through that. So you're talking about that we are waiting for a generation change and uh, like waiting for a new platform where a new products can arise? Yeah, I think it's kind of like a, um, it's, it's like, uh, what is, oh man, I'm, this is a terrible, um, fitting the metaphor. Um, what's, what's the old mythological, like the, 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 um, heel, it, uh, uh, Achilles, Achilles. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's basically the, when there are these shifts that are happening, uh, they're basically the, these holes in, in their armor or, um, uh, opportunities that, that, um, oh, there's a better metaphor, death star. Like okay. when Luke Skywalker yeah. shot that little little thing in the Death Star, like that was a hole uh, mm. that disrupted the whole whole thing, and that's the same thing for platform and behavior shifts. I think for startups, you got to find that little hole and then take advantage of that and build something for it. Yeah, it's uh, quite an analogy, I think, for uh, startups. Yeah, <laughs> so smooth smooth analogy. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and uh, how do you think when when it could happen? When when time frame? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, that's that's. 
that's the hard one to predict. I think if you, um, it's always obvious in hindsight once there's a big shift. Um, it's the people that can see it uh, maybe a, a year earlier, but not five years earlier. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're also too soon, like Daily Booth is one example where maybe they were just too soon. If they launched five years later and they focused on mobile, that actually might have worked much better for them. So yeah, okay, we came back to the place, time, and uh, once again, time, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I think it's enough about trends and tech. Um, what about yourself? What is the most counterintuitive part, uh, lessons that you've learned um, when you were building product hands? Most unintuitive. Um, yeah. Actually, this is a more, unfortunately, more recent realization. And I think, uh, so I, I don't know if culturally it's the same in, in Europe, but in the US, in startups, there's a lot of desire and uh, belief that startups should be flat organizations, that everyone should have autonomy and control of, um, and complete uh, equal kind of footing to everyone else, and uh, that there shouldn't be titles, and that everyone should wear many hats. And there's some truth to that. But what I found is actually a lack of titles and a lack of kind of structure and hierarchy can actually be a really bad thing, even for small startups. And what we've done more recently on the product hunt team is, is really give people domain ownership over things and more structure. And, and we now have team leads. Before it was like everyone reporting to me, which is just not scalable. And that's been great for the team. People are more uh, motivated and it's clear on what they need to accomplish and what they're responsible for. And I think that's, that's maybe something that was counterintuitive for me is, is that hierarchy and titles and all those things are not bad things. There's actually a reason why people in most companies have that kind of structure. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that's just one of many things I think that I've learned uh, just on the job. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thanks. Um, question to the audience. Uh, guys, I, th I, I know that we have some startups here. Can you raise the hands who were launched on Product Hunt? Yeah, one, one two, oh my god. Maybe 10, 15? Yeah, 16? awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, experienced people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, cool. Maybe uh, you can share some best practices or top advice to that one who do not already launch Product Hunt? Yeah, so I... I get this question a lot, like how do I launch, like what's, what's the right strategy, and um, the advice to launch on product is the same advice that I give for anyone launching a product in general, um, and there's a few things. One is, uh, there's no such thing as like a single launch, like you're, you're basically always launching, uh, whether it's your first version, your second version, new feature, you're basically always shipping and always launching, and so to think that startups are build, 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 launch, and then you're done is just not the right frame of mind. Um, but then when you do launch, when you're announcing something, um, it really depends on how you're approaching it and who your customer is. But um, one, one mistake I see a lot of people make, especially when they launch their first version, is they get so wrapped up in their vision and their like, five-year plan that they try to sell the dream and like, the things that are in your head rather than sell the product that you built today. And what I mean by that is... You, it's better to describe what your thing does and, and how it's useful than you know, describe it as like the future of remote working. Let's say you're building a video conferencing app and you're like, the future of remote working is your ta tagline. If someone reads that, they're gonna be like, what the hell does it do? <laughs> like, it doesn't mean anything to me. Uh, whereas if you maybe describe it as like a uh, super fast way to s speak with your friends over video chat or something, or your coworkers over video chat. Like that's, maybe that's not the best tagline, but that's at least more articulate of what it does. And that's the thing that I think a lot of people just don't think through is like, how do you describe succinctly what your product does to people? Mm -hmm. Because they, they don't have any context that you have. And they also don't care what your five-year vision is. They just want to solve a problem in their life or, or have some sort of description of what it does. So I think that's just generally, you know, advice for product hunt launching or just launching in general is the messaging. And one way to test it is talk to people who are not your friends and don't know anything about your product and show them your landing page or describe your tagline and just get their feedback, get their impressions. And those people will, hopefully they'll, they'll say, oh, that's interesting, or, or they might say, I don't get it, what does it do? And then you'll realize you need to rework it. Yeah, I think it's like referring back to the community-driven product management. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, you're so wrapped up in your head. Going back to what I said before, when I was a product manager, 
I sat there on the weekends and I was documenting specs for features and not talking to people, and I was really in my own bubble. So, um, yeah, if you could just get, get outside your bubble, get feedback, it could be incredibly helpful. But maybe uh, there is some catch in it. So you can just talk too much to people and uh, they w somehow it will uh, change your decisions for bad, I, th I think. It's for sure maybe for good, but it could be yeah. for bad. That's where, that's where having a perspective is important. So if, you, if you're someone who is, uh, doesn't have a perspective or belief or some sort of direction, just only talking to people is going to be it's going to be hard to come up with like a clear idea or, or p paint a picture of the future. So I think I would use all of those things as inputs to your own decision making and not necessarily as the goal isn't for the customer to tell you what to build, it's for the customer to inform your decisions of what to build. Okay, awesome. Um, I think I we, think that the, yeah. it will be the last question. If there will be one you, you're talking about from audience? Uh, well, no, you ran out of time. No, so. I'm also uh, run out of questions, so yeah. So we're okay. good to go. Uh, well, big round of applause for Ryan and Europe. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Thanks. It was a pleasure to talk to you.